and I'm delighted to say we've got Andy Mitten with us. Andy, we were having a debate earlier on. This is um, as as unconventional and unpredictable a season as this has been for Manchester United. In a weird way, going away to Chelsea and winning wasn't that unpredictable for this team. They've been really good against some of the good teams and really poor against some of the uh, the poor teams. So how do you how do you come to grips with what happened last night? I agree with you. I can remember speaking to you before the, the Tottenham game in December when the mood was as bad as it was ahead of Chelsea yesterday. There was a sense that the team really needed a win. Before yesterday, Manchester United had won one league game so far this year. You go to Chelsea, a place where traditionally United have been very, very poor. However, they've now won the last three games away at Chelsea. They won 2-0. They kept another clean sheet. And I was waiting outside the changing room area after the game and everything seemed to be sweetness and nice, which I could not have predicted ahead of, of that match. There were so many positives that came out of it. Harry Maguire got his first league goal and that was much needed. He had a great game. Uh, Eric Bailly was the guy I spoke to. It was, his, it was his first competitive game since last April. I thought he had a really good match. And United rode the luck. They didn't start particularly well. They looked very rusty at the start, including Bailly. But a 2-0 win at Chelsea... That's closed the gap to three points against Chelsea in fourth. Had Chelsea won, that would have been nine points. So it was a really, really important that Manchester United didn't lose at Stamford Bridge last night. That they won, well, the sun's rising above Stamford Bridge behind me and life seems quite wonderful. Yeah, there's very few six-pointers in your life where you actually get the, the six points as, as obvious. It was a, a legitimate six-pointer. And to come through on the other side of that, Gives everybody a little bit of confidence. Uh, Fernandez was good in midfield. There's like, there's there's enough building blocks here. Arwan Bissaka looked like someone who is growing into the role and the responsibilities, and and uh, has a sense of confidence in his own ability now. Yeah, Bissaka's crossing is is really improved, and there's elements of his game when he's going forward which are not as good as when he's he's uh, defending, and the defence has looked quite settled this year. So it was a surprise that Lindelof was taken ill, but by told me that he's been going to see the manager saying, when am I going to play? When am I going to play? He got his chance. He absolutely took his chance. I think you're right about Bruno Fernandes. He gives an attacking impetus. He put the ball in for Harry Maguire. And it's all right me saying Harry Maguire should be getting his head on some more balls. If he's not getting good quality balls, and he hasn't been this season, then he's only partly to blame for that. Uh, Fernandes has come in. He's looking confident. He's playing in a new league. And he's not really done anything wrong yet. He had a pretty encouraging debut. But United have got to be winning. They'd won nine out of 25 league games before last night. It's nowhere near good enough when the team are eighth and ninth. So to get that win, and what they've got to do now, and it brings back to your first point, they're playing Watford at the weekend. When they played Watford in December, they'd just beaten Spurs, they'd just beaten City. Watford had won one out of 17. And United lost. And they were terrible. It was so bad. And that wasn't an isolated bad performance. They were bad against Burnley at Old Trafford. They lost at home to Crystal Palace. You've got to be beating teams like that. And if not, people will start to ask questions of the manager, saying, well, if you can't, if you can't beat teams like this, why are you the manager? Yeah, and it, it's, it's well and good being up for the big games. It's well and good being tactically astute and planning for those big games. But you've got to do it against all those other teams as well. What was the formation last night? And was this, how often have we seen that this season? I, I'm, I'm not sure. It was 3 4 1 2. Um, with Jose Mourinho, I think he used 19 different defensive combinations in 21 matches. That's not happened this year. It's been very settled. You've had the Saka at right back, Lindelof, Maguire, and then one of um, Young, Shaw, or Williams at left back, and obviously they're here behind them. So it changed. Now, Bay told me that they've been practicing that formation for a week. They were practicing it in Marbella, and this is how they decided to frustrate Chelsea. And it worked. And they're very good at frustrating the best teams. The results against the best teams are really impressive. They're the only team. There's a team called Liverpool, who are they're from a city quite close to Manchester, and I hear they're having a good season, but. I saw them at Old Trafford in October and Man United almost beat them. Wow, almost beat Liverpool, you hear this Manchester United person say. But the point is true, that the, the, they can frustrate and beat and counter very well against the best teams. They can't break down uh, the, 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 the lesser teams. So 
it was it was a free at the back with um, Harry Maguire, probably his best game in the middle. Luke Shaw to his left, and and Bailly to his right, and they were fantastic. Like that is probably what got the best out of Harry Maguire. Is it? I know you can judge things in isolation too much too often, but that ability to just step in a little bit, just to take a little e extra yard or two to spray a pass left or right, because he has a protection now playing in the middle of a back three. This is possibly what will be the advent of Harry Maguire going on to, to have a great conclusion to the season. Yeah, and you use the word great. I don't think he's been great so far. I think he's been good. I think he's been seven out of ten. And last night, I think he was nine out of ten. He, given his price tag, which is nothing to do with him, he hasn't been the transformative signing that Van Dijk has been at Liverpool, for example. And while that goal's rightly celebrated last night, it was his first league goal. And he's played more than any other Manchester United player this season. He's played at least four games more than anybody else. And I think it's not been easy for him playing in behind a midfield, which has been so unsettled. Um, but it was really encouraging. He needed that goal, he really did, and he needs the crosses that he's getting, and hopefully that'll lift his confidence, because first goal in the league uh, in, in the middle of February, I think United fans are not unreasonable in asking for a little bit more, but he's the captain. Uh, I think he's had a good first season. He just needs to... If United are going to be, be serious about winning trophies again, he needs to become a great captain, a great leader, and one of the best defenders in the world. Is, is a great fox in the box and a great goal poacher somebody who can do nothing for an entire half and score a header like Anthony Martial did last night? Yeah, I, I, it was frustrating in the first half an hour because things were not going off for him. And he takes chances and when you're an attacking player, you try to beat somebody, you're more prone to losing the ball than if you're a defender and you're just passing it out. There's a few nice combinations on, on the left with Brandon Williams, but it was frustrating to watch. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I was in the crowd. I could feel the mood of the crowd. And then, bang, he does this Mick Harford impression. He rises above the defence. and Or is it Messi in Rome, where he, he became twice as high as he should have been? And scored a, a, a fantastic header. And I spoke to Bailly, because he's quite close to Martial. Obviously, they, they're both French speakers. And he said it will be good for his head and good for the, his confidence and also for that of the team. And I think that's true because if you're playing as a central striker and you're not renowned as being a central striker, then you need things to go your way. They weren't at the start of the game, but that goal was really important for him because he, he frustrates fans because they can see that he's talented and he'll have a good run of five or six games and then they'll have a poor run of five or six games. And that, again, is not good enough for Manchester United. Just to go back on the formation again, like obviously the back three slash five is the headline news from it, but maybe in the context of Anthony Martial, it's also interesting looking at the two up front. Now, I know James often peels wide. I, w I wonder, is this something that we could see a bit more often in the next couple of weeks, that you could see a Martial with a more centrally inclined player beside him, a la Odia Nagalo, perhaps? Yeah, I think it's needs must when, you, when you've got a light squad and you're missing Marcus Rashford, who's been the best player this season. You've got to try different combinations, and that one worked. I'll be interested to see how it works against Watford. Um, uh, Igalog, he came on. There was a big Nigeria flag in the Manchester United end. The stage was set for him. He came clean through. For, oh, my God, he can't score here. And he didn't. He nearly <laughs> scored. But he, he's, he's, I'm told he's, he, he's settling in well. Um I think United did well to get a striker in. Chelsea didn't. Barcelona didn't. He's got a good record when he started out at Watford. And I think it's a lone move that could suit all parties. But he's got a score. He's a striker. If, you, if you're calling me in May and he's not scored a goal, then it's not going to have worked out. But I'm glad they've got the option to play him. And he's a Manchester United fan as well. It's like a... This is a, it's a cliche, but it, it is a dream for him that he's signed for the club he's supported all of his life. And... He's really needed, and they need that option because there's a lot of games. There's the FA Cup and there's Europa League as well. The next game is where I'm on my way to now is Bruges in Belgium. They're going to win that competition. I think they should go to win it and the FA Cup. It's going to be a huge toll of games this season. Um, speaking of that toll of games, <clears throat> we, we've been talking about midfield and their inability to protect the defence, and they're also just they've been a, a, a much derided pairing of Matic and Fred but Matic and Fred with Fernandez is a, is a different prospect because he can actually provide an outlet ball for them short or long um, 
I don't want to overstate this, but is he a bit of a Jenga piece that actually improves both of those? That's obviously what his job is supposed to be, so that would be the bare minimum you would hope for. But can you see an improvement from them over the next few weeks? Yeah, I can. I think Fred has been has had a really good two or three months, and I won't say I backed him, but I've spoken to him a lot uh, throughout his Manchester United c career because he can't speak English yet, and. I've really wanted him to do well, but clearly if he's not doing well as a journalist, you've got to say that. And he, he had some absolute stinkers where his confidence was shot and he was doing well in training, but he was the best player on the pitch in the Manchester derby. So if you can be man of the match in a Manchester derby, you've got something. I thought he played very well last night. Matic is another one who you think he's on his way out and you hear phrases like, his legs have gone, he's finished. And... He was the best player at Manchester City a few weeks ago in, in that win. And I spoke to him last, last night after the game. He cuts a different figure to the one who went off seemingly in a sulk to, to Dubai a few months ago. And there's now talk of him having a contract extension. I think he's a really good footballer in the Man Matic. Uh, I wish he was four or five years younger. And he started really well when he came to, to United. And then he faded. By the start of this season, I remember interviewing him in, in Singapore. And I put a tweet out saying, just interviewed the Manu Matic. All we spoke about was Serbia and the war and just no reaction. So what? Because he, he, he was, he'd gone in the eyes of many Manchester United fans. And he hasn't now. He's become an important player again. You need these important players to become consistently important. And if you get that, you get a winning team. And they've not been able to find that since Solskjaer came in as manager after that great run. The big Manchester United story last night broke at 7.43pm on Twitter. Mino Raiola put up a, a three-part statement via images on Twitter. Uh, a lot of block caps, a lot of regular text here. For anybody who missed it, this is what he said. He said, Paul is not mine. This is Paul Pogba, of course, and for sure not Solskjaer's property. Paul is Paul Pogba's. You cannot own a human being already for a long time in the UK or anywhere else. I hope Solskjaer, in blocks now, do not want to suggest that Paul is his prisoner. But before Solskjaer makes comments about things, I say he should inform himself better about the content of what has been said. I'm a free citizen who can think and express my thoughts. Until now, I was maybe too nice to him. Solskjaer should just remember things that he said in the summer to Paul. And then the final part, I think Solskjaer may be frustrated for different reasons and is now mixing up some issues. I think that Solskjaer has had other things to worry about and block caps. At least, if I was him, I would. What does this even mean, uh, Andy? It's hard to even make, uh, make sense of this other than the fact that uh, Paul Pogba is nobody's prisoner. Uh, I think that Raiola is mixing up other issues as well. The player wants to leave. His agent would be um, financially remunerated if he cuts another deal to move him on. And I think United fans have been very patient with Paul Pogba. He talked about the unsettled midfield. Pogba is still the most talented player at the football club. He's the one with the quickest feet. He's the one who can get the ball out of tight situations in front of the defence. With Lobaye did it last night. I sense among the match-going fans a declining confidence in Paul Pogba. I really do. And these are people who've wanted him to work out. And I sense people saying, enough which is probably what Rayola wants because it would help drive down the price of Pogba. And what Oli Gunnar's doing is saying, we're nobody's mugs here. We're under no obligation to sell anybody. And actually, Pogba needs to be playing if he's going to be playing for France in, in the Euros. And I, I think he will probably leave 10%. We still wants him to be a success. There might be in a minority here and, and stay at the club. But it's about getting... A good, a good transfer fee for a world-class, um, World Cup winning midfielder. It's not worked out for him as he would have hoped. It's not the dream he was sold. But then he's party to that as well. He's been pretty inconsistent. And it's a shame because he's a great footballer. And I think he's a decent person as well. But if your best player wants to leave, don't think that's a great thing for the dressing room. Yeah, it, it, you probably need to get rid of him. And then there's all of a sudden room to replace him, room to change the impact that having that player who is your best player not want to play for you. If, if Man United handle this right over the next six months, the dressing room will be a completely different place. It'll, it'll be Harry Maguire's team. It'll be Aaron wan -Bissaka's team. It'll be Marcus Rashford's team. Yeah, if, if, if 
Paul Pogba is the main man in the dressing room. So it's not just about him wanting to go. You've got players who look up to him and he influences them in the way they dress, the music that they, they listen to. So if he leaves, the dynamic completely changes and shifts towards, uh, the lad you were saying, Rashford, Mancunium, uh, Maguire from Sheffield, English lads, there would definitely be um, a, a, a change there. But the, the frustrating thing with this Manchester United is there's so many ifs from courts and, and what-ifs that they can go and beat these best teams and then lose against uh, the, the, the weaker teams. It really frustrates um, United fans because they get glimpses of what could come and then it doesn't quite come. And I think this season has got to finish strongly. With or without Pogba, it cannot fade away like last season did or Mourinho's final season or Van Gaal's final season. It simply can't because I think Oli Gunnar's job will be under real pressure if that happens. There's got to be a good cup run. There's got to be an improved league form. And they can they can come at it from quite a low base now because they've been that bad. Mm. Yeah. Andy, good stuff. In, uh, enjoy Bruges. Beware of the Irish hitmen. <laughs> I'm actually going to Mons and, and Waterloo. And Mons was where the First World War started and finished. And I'm told that the, the frontline troops were the Irish Lancers who were the, among the first to engage uh, with the German troops. So I will report back and let you know my findings. Operation Human Shield, I believe they call the Irish uh, in the in that army. <laughs> Andy, okay, well, that, that's a slightly different um, spin on it, but I'll, uh, I'll report back my findings. Andy, good stuff. Thanks a million. Enjoy the trip. Cheers. Thank you. It's uh, Andy Mitten giving us some thoughts and uh, a bit of World War One history. He's got to check out the alcoves now once he goes to, to Bruges. It's the, the number one priority, I would have thought.